Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for our very first event of the Rowan Center for Responsible Leadership for fall 2021. And tonight we are very excited to welcome Anna Ship uh, from the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia. So Anna is the executive director of the SBN where she's worked since 2013. As the executive director, Anna has led SBN in the implementation of their mission and in particular, to challenge and support the business community to build profitable enterprises that serve community needs, share wealth, and protect the environment. So Anna has dedicated her career to social and economic equality and climate resilience. Prior to SBN, Anna worked to empower youth through important educational, recreational, and career building opportunities. She also worked with people experiencing chronic unemployment or underemployment providing them with the resources they needed to overcome barriers and regain financial independence. Anna has also worked with several local, state, and national parks on multi-stage projects to reduce erosion from stormwater runoff, improve habitat, and enhance visitors' experiences in those parks. Anna holds a Master's of Environmental Studies from the University of Pennsylvania, where her academic work focused on urban sustainability. In 2012, she was the US Forest Service Sustainability Science Fellow. She was the 2013 recipient of the Dr. Frederick Scatena Award for Outstanding Research in Urban Forestry. And she was a 2015 Fellow of the Environmental Leadership Program. She was a past board member of the Philadelphia Land Bank and the South Philly Food Co-op. So we're all very pleased to welcome you, Anna. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will turn it over to you. Thanks, and thanks for getting through all that. <laughs> Absolutely, it's an impressive record. <laughs> um, and I'm truly uh, thrilled to be here and, and help you all kick off uh, kick off the fall semester. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. And um, uh, yeah, so what I what I want to do, uh, hopefully everyone can see the screen okay, is just share a little bit about the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia, um, a little bit about our origin story, um, which I think is very relevant for, um, for each of you in, in this class, um, and uh, elaborate on the case for local independent businesses. So why, why SBN pays attention to them, why they're important for everyone to pay attention to, um, and then definitely the case for the triple bottom line. And um, a little bit on the distinctions between the triple bottom line and corporate social responsibility, because there are distinctions, and I'm excited to have that actual debate with all of you. Um, and then, um, and so, and so that that's kind of the the run of show. And um, you know, there is definitely room for room for questions and conversation throughout. Um, I'm going to be um, sharing some some sort of prompt questions. So hopefully you've got your um, audience participation hats on, um, and uh, and we'll you know we'll kind of engage in conversation that way. Um, but I'll I'll just kind of kick things off first with um, a little bit about um, the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia. So so as um, as Jordan shared, um, our mission is to build a just, green, and thriving economy in the Greater Philadelphia region. Um, we do that through a number of different ways. Um, first is that we empower the region's diverse independent business community to do well by doing good. Um, second is that we advance industries that are critical to a vibrant local equitable and climate resilient economy. Um, specifically, we focus on resilient and responsible food systems, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and nature-based stormwater management or green stormwater infrastructure, depending on how wonky you wanna get. Um, and then we also advocate for um, an economic ecosystem that centers localism, serves community needs, shares wealth, and protects our environment. Um, our members are all local independent businesses that are headquartered in the greater Philadelphia region um, and that practice and measure success by what we call this triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. So hopefully you have heard that um, phrase before. I'll get more about, I'll explain more about it later. Um, and our programming educates business owners about socially, environmentally, and financially responsible business practices. So again, like doing well by doing good. So how through social and environmental responsibility, you can actually grow your business and be more, um, be a stronger, more resilient business as a result, be more competitive as a result. Um, our programming also facilitates really honest and supportive discussions among peers. So it's really 
really hard to be an independent business owner on the best of days. It's definitely hard to do that when you're trying to practice with your integrity every day, like every decision is, is you know, kind of a, a moral compass decision. Um, and so, you know, second to friends and family, a supportive peer community is actually ranked by business owners as a huge, huge important resource for them. And so we provide that in a very unique way. Um, and, uh, and we also provide really important opportunities for our members to engage in civic dialogue. So direct conversations with um, elected officials and other government representatives that help them tell their story, um, help them you know, kind of like name their needs and, and otherwise um, provide an alternative business voice, right? So there's this kind of false narrative that business and environment and equity are mutually exclusive things. Um, and so our business community is here to say, actually, we completely disagree. We're here to prove to you how how wrong that is. Um, and we're here to tell you that this business community wants um, you government leaders to, to advance social equity and environmental, um, environmental resilience. And so our advocacy then focuses on solutions that advance a just green and thriving economy. So again, um, an economic ecosystem that centers diverse local independent businesses, um, uh, equity and in the workplace and beyond, and also climate resilience. Um, and for us, those things are deeply interdependent and interconnected. Um, and I can elaborate on that later if, if there are questions about that. Um, and then since our founding in 2001, we've remained the region's only membership and advocacy organization um, in our minds playing the very important role of serving greater Philadelphia's diverse, independent, and values-driven business community. So our origin story, I love, I love telling the story. It's so good. I don't know if anyone knows Judy Wicks, um, but for folks that don't know her name, she is a living legend. Um, she is a um, kind of a, yeah, kind of a yeah, local, local superstar, but really has, um, and I'll kind of share her story. And if you want to hear in, in her words, um, she has a book and it's really good. It's hilarious. She's a great storyteller. Um, so if you don't know Judy Wicks, do you know the, do you know free people, the urban outfitters empire? Who knows that? Yes, we all do. Um, <laughs> and so Judy um, goes, goes back to that. So um, Free People was originally just a single retailer, um, kind of back in the in the 70s. She and her husband at the time opened this little shop um, that was bohemian of, of the era. <laughs> and um, out of necessity, um, their um, displays were, you know, just found found things. And so like spools from, you know, big industrial, um, you know, electric cables and things of that nature, which now we know is kind of a very curated look. Um, but back then it was out of necessity. Um, and, you know, it's um, one of those things where Judy and her husband at the time um, had pretty fundamental kind of, it, it emerged, they had very fundamental disagreements on what it meant to grow a business. Um, and so for Judy, it meant, um, deeper roots in her community. It meant getting to know her customers better. Um, it meant knowing her supply chain and all kinds of other things. And for her husband, it meant multiplication. It meant, it meant you know, more stores, more locations, more money. Um, and we've seen, you know, kind of Judy, Judy's trajectory, you know, you can kind of get a sense of that and I'll get to that. But her ex-husband's trajectory, we've seen in kind of what the Urban Outfitters Empire looks like, right? So it's the free people, it's the uh, anthropology, it's it's beholden, it's terrain, right? It's just constant, constant, constant growth. Um, and so feel all your feelings about that, whatever you have. But um, but I think what what the interesting part is is that Judy really challenged, I think, what a lot of people. Um, uh, we're taught, which is business success means you must keep growing, you must keep making more money. And Judy said, that's not growth for me. That's not what success looks like for me. And so this is what I'm going to do differently. And so she went from free people to the White Dog Cafe. And so she's kind of a serial entrepreneur. Um, so the White Dog Cafe is another kind of legendary um, place in Philadelphia and in the farm to table movement. Um, and so this was now in the 80s. Um, and still Judy, you know, kind of wanted to 
um, have this relationship with her customers. And so of the era also, and just because it was Judy and she's an activist, um, she would have like speaker series and lecture series. And so she would have all of these folks come into the restaurant um, and engage in really great conversation and debate with her customers who in many times were there for exactly that. So they would, you know, eat this delicious food and, you know, kind of civically engage. Um, and something that's pretty powerful um, about Judy's story is that she at some point um, learned about the pork industry and um, the farms and practices that were not only bad for the pigs themselves, but also for the people um, that were raising those, um, those animals. And, um, and she was so distraught by what she heard that again, super unprecedented and very, very risky for a restaurant owner. Um, mixed all pork products from her menu like almost immediately. And so I can't imagine being her chef at that point. Um, I'm sure that didn't go over very well, but, um, but that's what she did. She was like, I can't in good conscience serve this food. Um, and so that started her on a quest, on kind of a, a mission to find um, farms that she could trust. Um, she didn't want to not serve, you know, food. She wanted to obviously hit a restaurant to, to, um, to run. And so um, the greater Philadelphia region has an incredible, incredible food belt. Um, everything out from Lancaster to, you know, to central Jersey, um, it's an incredible food belt. And so lots and lots of local farms, um, you know, 40 years ago, um, you know, that it wasn't nearly as strong. Um, and so Judy found this community of local farmers that she really related with and connected to and kind of had this realization that their their businesses too like they need to survive and if I'm the only one who's sourcing from them as a restaurant then they're not going to survive and I'm not going to survive so I need to make sure that my competitors also purchase from these small local farmers um, and so again super risky move that had you know a little bit of <laughs> A little bit of um, self-serving in there, but also, you know, that that's how she operated. It was this very collaborative and cooperative mindset. And so started shopping these local farms to her competitors. And eventually that became Fair Food, a nonprofit that was around from 2001 till about 2018. Um, and that organization um, really, I think, set the stage for, again, this farm to table movement. So the organization was designed to connect local farmers directly with restauranteurs um, in the region. And I think they basically put themselves, put themselves out of business, which is every nonprofit's dream, when you don't need us anymore, right? Um, and so, you know, all of these restaurants had developed such great relationships with these suppliers that, um, that food, food wasn't, wasn't needed. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, of course, but, and then in the same year, she also founded the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia, and so that was more, um, more broad, so here's this community of, of values-driven businesses that, um, you know, obviously, you know, need, need supply, right, they need to work with each other, um, they have accounting needs and legal needs and, um, you know, supply needs, but also, like, again, running a business is hard, and you need to have folks in your network that you can ask, you know, questions of and say, hey, am I crazy? Or are you experiencing this too? Um, and so that was SBN. It was meant to be a community of entrepreneurs that could learn together, work together, grow together, um, and learn how to be not just better businesses, like just financially, but more socially and environmentally responsible businesses by sharing best practices. Um, and that, you know, we've been again around since 2001. Um, and we're the only, the second organization of our kind in the entire country. Um, so there's an SBN of Boston, um, which is now SBN of Massachusetts. Uh, Lori Hamill is who runs that organization, who founded that organization. And SBN of Greater Philadelphia and SBN of Boston at the time also co-founded, Lori and Judy, in the same year, 2001, co-founded the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, now known as Common Future. Um, and that entity, that nonprofit was a national nonprofit um, and basically served as an incubator for um, SBN-like organizations across North America. And so over the course of 10, 12 years, um, we incubated 80 um, SBNs, you know, in some version across, across North America, which is really, really incredible. Um, 
And so again, Judy has this incredible legacy. Like just think about all those things that she's had a role in that are now just really powerful movements. Um, so the farm to table movement, this local living economy movement, um, you know, Judy's had a hand in all of those from the beginning. Um, and so I don't think it's, um, uh, I don't think it's random that B-Lab then decided to headquarter themselves in the greater Philadelphia, Philadelphia suburbs. Um, and so can I get maybe a show of like digital yellow hands or, or like, like actual hands, like who's familiar with B-Lab? See Jordan. <laughs> um, great. Um, whoever uh, can't see everyone's hand, but um, if there's anyone that wants to share what they know about B-Lab, if not, I'm happy. I'm happy to you know keep keep at it. <laughs> You've got a few uh, responders. So oh, great. So if you were a non me responder, what did you hear about B-Lab? Uh. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Go for it. We can't hear you anymore, though. We could hear you for a second. Okay. Um, I guess uh, what I knew about the meat lab is that the company that's making the fake meat, like uh, bio growing all the, you know, Mm, not quite. There are those companies, though. <laughs> I don't think either um, of the big ones are B, B companies, though, now that we mentioned that. Either Impossible true. or Beyond. I don't think they're B, B companies. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, so B Lab, if folks know what a certified benefit corporation is, um, B Lab is the international accrediting body, the nonprofit um, that... Um, uh, evaluates your triple bottom line practices. So your social, environmental, um, and economic practices. It's a incredibly, incredibly rigorous process. Um, and they've made it even harder over the years. <laughs> um, and they keep, they keep kind of like cranking it up, um, kind of turning up the, the notch a little bit on, on their expectations of, of what it means to be a certified benefit corporation. So basically, um, businesses need to take a very, very rigorous evaluation um, it's a ton of questions. It takes a lot of time. Um, you have to go into all of your files and, you know, kind of answer these questions with a ton of detail. You have to then um, get a certain uh, minimum number of points to even be eligible um, to have a certified benefit corporation status. Um, from then, if you decide to pursue your certified benefit corporation status, you have to pay B-Lab some money who then audits all of your answers to verify all of your answers. Show me your books. Tell me about your practices. Let me see. To then have B-Lab say, all right, you check out. Now you have the certification. To then have to do all of that every couple of years to meet their renewed criteria. So if you see, I wish I had the logo here, but if you see a very simple black B with a black circle around it against a white background, that's a certified benefit corporation and you know they have met some pretty rigorous standards. Um, and so that organization, again, is headquartered in um, Philadelphia suburbs. And in 2006 is when they were founded um, and SBN piloted their very first impact assessment. So that assessment that's used to measure and evaluate a business's triple bottom line. So we, we tested that out. We vetted that out with our membership provided a lot of feedback um, to B Lab, And now again, that was the base, that was the base tool, the foundational tool um, for this international accreditation. So we're really, really proud of that. Um, very proud of our roots. We have a great legacy of, of leadership um, locally and in the region. And like I said, if you if you want to hear more about you know Judy's story in particular, which is a little bit of SBN story, um, she's a great storyteller. She hasn't asked me to pitch her book, but I'm pitching her book. <laughs> it's really fun to read. She's hilarious. Um, and so definitely, definitely check that out. Um, I do see a couple things in the chat. So I'm going to just pause here and see um, if anyone sort of like from this facilitation side of things, if, if there's a question that, um, uh, that would be good for me to answer right now. 
And um, <clears throat> excuse me, Hasi uh, had a really interesting question. She worked for Athleta, a B Corp, which is uh, owned by the Gap, a very much non B Corp. So what, uh, what's the deal with that sort of thing? If you can explain and, and how that relates to your organization's uh, work with yeah. That is a really good question. Um, and Campbell's has some of that too, where like the parent company is not certified benefit corporation, but they have their, some of their brands well, so are certified. Um, it's confusing for me too. <laughs> um, but, but basically to me, that's a pretty loud demonstration that they understand that this particular um, target audience for this particular brand cares about these things. And so why they haven't applied that writ large to the rest of their brands, I don't know. Um, but I do think that it tells a pretty loud story that these companies are pretty keenly aware of, of consumer trends and even um, uh, employee trends um, kind of working for, and we can get to that later, but um, these trends are really showing all, um, uh, sort of they're putting increased pressure on, on larger corporations to, to implement some of these practices. Um, wow. And the other thing about certified benefit corporate status is that it requires a pretty um, strong degree of transparency. And so um, it's not just about X, Y, and Z, we do these things from a marketing standpoint, like it's, it's true transparency. And so um, I think that's another um, again, kind of indicator of market pressure um, to have businesses like um, like Athleta who are under the gap um, to you know to practice this stuff. Yeah, Asi, did you have more you wanted to ask about? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So, um, I mean, so what was interesting to me was that like, I guess you kind of touched on it, like with the like greenwashing of things and. What was hard for me was like, you know, we would we would we would sell the fact that the pants were made out of recycled water bottles, but then we would get, you know, one shirt packaged with an intense amount of single use plastic that we didn't have anything to do with was non recyclable. Um, and it was just such a disconnect between like us telling customers like, hey, it's a B Corp and we make our pants out of water bottles and you know, this, that, and a third, and then seeing the way the practices were. And like, I, I thought the same thing. I thought, oh man, okay, well, like maybe it's just Gap as a parent company, you know, enforcing these things. But Gap as a whole is B Corp certified, um, which includes like Old Navy, Banana Republic, and all of Gap brands. And um, like, I'm, I'm Indian also. So I took a big uh, like interest in sort of what was happening in Bangladesh with like the garment factory workers. And I know that like Old Navy um, was sort of like a very specific one that kept coming up as like a big perpetrator of it. And um, like, I, it was something that I saw like this inconsistency with in practice that like, you know, what we were telling consumers wasn't exactly what we were seeing demonstrated behind closed doors. And then, um, yeah, just just overall that it was all Gap companies. And I don't think anyone looks at like, you know, Old Navy and thinks, ah, oh, yes, that's not that fast fashion. You know what I mean? And so it was a little, and I know that, um, like I looked it up and what you were saying about like transparency. And I know that they have like, um, like I said, like they make their water, bo their water bottle pants and they like, you know, they have these, these goals but my biggest concern was like, do you think that there was a level of greenwashing or even to the degree of like, I, I guess it's a third party thing. So there's no a ability to sort of like buy the certification. So, but um, yeah, I was just wondering how you thought that that sort of was a, uh, achievable by a company like that. Yeah. That's a really great question. I think, um, you know, I think that that really points to kind of the imperfection of it all, right? Um, but I would say that from my personal opinion that I have a pretty healthy skepticism in general for publicly traded companies, period. Um, and, um, and, you know, I mean, that's informed by my work. <laughs> that's me personally speaking. Um, 
But I think I think the other thing that's important to remember is, and I'm not defend, I'm not defending this at all, but um, B Lab has five different categories, and so you can you know, to some degree, like not do well at all in one category and shine another one and that can carry you, right? Um, and so if you want to look at um, you know, the scores of any given business, you can go to B-Lab's website um, and look up a company by name and it'll tell you like kind of their, their points. Um, and again, it's a minimum number of points. And so even if they kind of come in right at the threshold um, and they want to get the certification and they can do that, um, and if they want to keep that certification, they have to re, you know, read that and reapply. Um, but I hear you, and I think I think that that story is, I think, a really important example of, in my mind, the very um, strong distinction between triple bottom line and corporate social responsibility. Right. So, so we can corporate social responsibility. I don't want to jump ahead too much, but but that sort of like. Um, like we do this one thing over here that is meant to, in my mind, kind of appease from a market standpoint, um, our shareholders and our consumers and everybody else, but it's not changing our internal practices, right? Um, and so, and so to me, that's a really loud example, right? Versus, um, and we'll, we'll get to this. So like kind of in your mind, think about that example versus like a company you know, like Patagonia, um, and you can, you know, kind of get a, get a sense for kind of how they market themselves and, you know, and again, imperfect. So we'll get there um, because greenwashing is absolutely a thing. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. And, and yeah, hold, hold on to that, um, that idea and that example for, um, for a little bit later. Um, were there other, um, other comments or questions in this moment um, before I move on? Anna, there was another question about uh, B Corps and whether they're continually audited or is it just a one-time thing? It's it's every every few years, I think, I think right? It's every three years, I want to yeah. say. Yeah, that's my understanding. But uh, but yeah, B Lab would have more information on that. Yeah, we had uh, one of the senior uh, standards people uh, speak with us last year or two years ago, Jasmine Jones, it, and and she had a lot of uh, info about the. Yeah. It's quite rigorous. You know, and it, it takes some time. So for it whatever that's for. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. And they put they put pressure on, I mean again, it's very imperfect, but they put pressure on um, every B Corp to do better, right? And so um, you know, and so I think that as imperfect as you know some things are, including the example that um that was just given, you know, it's better than nothing, you know, and we'd like there to be more and we'd like there like be more B Corps and we'd and whether you are or not a B Corp, we'd like there to be more businesses that hold to those standards and that continue to challenge themselves to do better. Um, and so, you know, I think as a starting point, even though there are some contradictions, um, it's a starting point, right? So, so that's an important thing. Um, others? It look like our, our list of typed questions for now anyway, but okay. I'm sure there's more percolating. Great, great, great. Um, so let me keep going, um, and this gets to why local. Um, and so there's a lot, a lot of stuff here. Um, and obviously, these statistics I think are really important. Um, and I'll send this out so that you can click on some of these links and you know kind of dig dig a little bit more. But um, Really, I think the, the unique and powerful thing about independent businesses is not just the scale, like just like the sheer volume of them, right, which is huge economic power, um, but the, the fact that as an independent business, I'm not beholden to sort of legally binding um, you know, agreements with my shareholders, right? Um, I'm not beholden to maximizing profits. I can bring my value, I can define success for myself and I can bring my values to work in a, in a much easier way. And I can make a decision without having to run it up this, you know, um, this bureaucratic, um, you know, ladder, right? And kind of all, all the red tape. So, um, and that to me is a really, really powerful thing. So, um, a lot of the, a, 
a vast majority of, of, as an example, B Corps without, you know, not every, not every triple bottom line business is, is a B Corp, but as an example, the vast majority of those businesses are independent businesses. Um, they're still privately held. Um, and so I think that's a pretty big indicator um, of the strength of local. So in addition to obviously these statistics, um, you know, owning a business, you know, gives folks, um, it's a wealth building tool, right? It gives folks the opportunity for financial independence. Um, there's a lot of folks that start businesses out of necessity because they're, they don't feel like they're employable for a variety of reasons. Um, and so there's all different kinds of businesses and there's, um, you know, uh, there's the more like in your face traditional economy and there's this whole other like underground economy. And so just think about business in a bunch of different ways. Um, but it's a, it's a wealth building tool and the opportunity to give people financial independence. It creates more employment opportunities. So look at these jobs numbers. Um, independent businesses, small businesses were responsible for 67% of all new jobs following the last recession, the 2008-2009 recession. That's humongous. And so, um, you know, thinking about COVID recovery and relief, I think that small businesses are hopefully going to play a really strong role in that, even though they were pretty devastated. Um, I'm optimistic that small businesses are going to continue to shine um, coming out of this, obviously with, with responsible support. but. Um, and I think they support economic innovation. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the a lot of the nimbleness that we see when it comes to creativity and innovation, um, you know, of course, of course, resources matter, <laughs> financial resources matter, but um, but we're not, you know, when we see, as I mentioned before, large corporations, um, I think one of my favorite examples is, um, is when Walmart started selling um, local produce and they had all those local flags in, in their shop, in their stores, um, that's market pressure. <laughs> that is not because Walmart cares about local, that's because they care about customers and they understood that the pressure from the independent businesses and the farmers markets was something they had to respond to. And so to me, when you start seeing some of those um, marketing strategies, we're in your neighborhood, we're friendly, we're authentic, right, from large corporations. Um, the only ones that can do that sincerely are the independent businesses themselves. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of, of the pressure that those larger corporations are beginning to feel when you pay attention in that way to their marketing strategies. Um, so yeah, the innovation, I think, is pretty real. Um, they're proven to be an engine for economic growth and have a significant local economic multiplier effect. Um, and the research shows that it's actually three times more. So when you buy something at a local a retailer, as an example, um, versus a big box retailer, that dollar circulates in the local economy three more times. And so um, for all the folks here, that's direct impact induced impact um, and indirect, right? So direct, indirect and induced economic impact. And that is three more times, 300% um, more than if you spent that dollar at a, at a box store. And there's a lot of evidence to back that up. And that's again, really, really powerful. Um, and so prioritizing and incentivizing more local independent businesses by the government, community organizations and business districts is really crucial for ensuring the long-term sustainability of community-based economic corridors and local economies. Um, as an example, small business development centers or SBDCs um, provide current and future business owners with free training in person consulting and help with technology. SBDC clients have created 93,471 jobs and $7 billion in new sales. Um, these investments in business development have significantly higher returns on investment than development incentive tax credit programs used to attract or reward large corporations. So you, um, cities, governments have their business development efforts and their business attraction efforts, and they usually spend far more money on business attraction, even though all of the evidence is very inconclusive that that does anything. And yet there's a ton of evidence that says business development efforts have huge and very consistent return on investment. And so the SBDCs are one example. So for every federal dollar invested in SBDCs, generated $2 in federal revenue, nearly $3 in state revenue, 
and nearly $50 in new capital, whereas multiple studies have found, again, business attraction efforts are very inconclusive and often ineffective. So take that ROI. Um, and then CDFI funds, community development um, finance institutions are also a significant engine of economic growth for local businesses. Um, and so CDFI funds um, were huge, huge, huge in the um, COVID recovery relief. Um, and let's see. Um, yeah, and, and so I think that there's a, the, um, the other piece that's important here is um, just local in general. Obviously, there's a ton of evidence, but um, I think a lot of a lot of um, governments and other uh, institutions like to focus on the startups because they're fun, right? Like new new businesses, new startups, um, and the accelerators, right? And so kind of folks in that like. Um, that really accelerated growth stage, but there's this middle, this middle area that is not often attended to, and that is where businesses either grow or don't, right? They either um, keep going or they fail. And so there's this really important window in like the three to seven year mark um, that needs a lot more attention. So for folks that have any interest um, in that aspect of business, um, whether it's capital or technical assistance or advocacy or what have you from a policy standpoint, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to help businesses after they start up and before they get over that, like that first or second big hump um, in their business lifetime. Um, any questions or comments about the, the why local um, before I move on to the next piece? There's so much more we could say here, but <laughs> yeah, any questions um, before I move on? I had a question, but I'm happy to let someone else go first if there Great. is another another question. Uh, well, folks are thinking, last spring, uh, Ashley Putnam from the Philadelphia uh, Federal Reserve Bank uh, shared with us her work on uh, community economies. And I invited her to this event and she said she knew you really well. Already. Yes, yes. <laughs> but still talking about a lot of the same issues. There seems like there's a huge gap in, in capital and also technical support. Uh, for companies under a certain size, you know, within any economy. And it's a shame because those are frequently the companies, as you point out, that are that are employing the most people that are kind of these wealth building opportunities and and things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But my, my question, if, if folks are still thinking, well, they're ruminating on what to ask is, um, is the distinction really local? companies versus national or international companies? Is that the distinction we should focus on? Or is it better understood as, as publicly traded versus privately held? Because at the end of the day, every, you know, even Target is, is a local company in Minneapolis. Mm. You know, there's some locality that's going on. Is it, the, is it the nature of ownership that's more important? Or is it really something about the geographic location that's a great question. Yeah, um, really great question. So um, for us, it's a mix, right? So a national or multinational company that has a local office or a local um, location, right? Um, you know, like a Target, like shopping at that Target, you know, that's not a local business, right? But shopping at a retailer, um, you know, that you know, even if you can't get everything in the one shop, you have to go to three different places maybe, but, um, but that is exponentially better. Again, it's, it's um, excuse me, in terms of spending your dollars. And so, so the local presence, right? Cause I mean, again, not to, not to kind of have at it, but like, you know, Comcast is, uh, is headquartered in Philadelphia, not a local business, right? They, they're headquartered here, um, and so in many ways, they should care um, about Philadelphia and Philadelphia's success. And I think they sometimes make it look like they do. Um, but um, this is, I got to be careful. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, they do, they do, um, they do make an effort, right? Um, but is that the same level of civic engagement and contribution 
that a different independent, you know, that, a, that another business would have if they were independently owned, um, right? So, so proportionally speaking, kind of again, if you just look at the, the ratio of how many dollars Comcast has compared to what they give out versus like, you know, another business that has a local presence and the ratio of that, um, it's not always about money either, but it's about, you know, other, other types of things. Um, so yeah, the local, the local piece is really big. The ownership piece is also really big. Um, and so if you think about, um, if you think about fair trade, um, that's I think a really great way to think about it. So fair trade is local to local. Um, so Greater Philadelphia can't grow coffee. We're never gonna be able to grow coffee or avocados or bananas. It's just not in, it's just not in our, in our uh, climate, right? Um, and so the best way to then purchase those things is to go through fair trade, which is us locally supporting local farmers and local companies in a different geography, right? So that's, that's kind of a way to think about it. And so, um, uh, so yeah, it's the local piece, it's the independent piece, the ind I mean, and it's, it's not black and white, but, but nine times out of 10, um, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have a better result if, if that is, uh, if that's how you're, even just from an econ purely economic perspective, right, kind of the circulation of dollars. Um, the other thing that you, that you mentioned, Jordan, which I just want to sit in for a second is, is around the size of, of businesses. And so um, I think that's another challenge, uh, just from a capital standpoint, but again, from a policy standpoint too, you have to meet like a minimum threshold to, you know, have access to a lot of different resources. And you know, thinking about Philadelphia as an example that has one of the lowest rates of per capita business ownership um, for small businesses and um, one of the, if not the lowest per capita ratio of business ownership among folks of color, right? And when you have, again, in Philadelphia and across the country, these trends are the same. Um, business owners of color, women-owned businesses, and there isn't a whole lot of data on LGBTQ businesses or immigrant businesses, but the revenue and the number of employees tends to be much, much smaller than, uh, you know, cis, hetero, white, male-owned business, right? Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and capital is one of them, um, you know, all kinds of historical, you know, roots there, and same thing with policies and other, other types of things. Um, because you have a city like Philadelphia that is almost 70% folks of color, and the inverse is true for our business ownership. Almost 70% of the businesses, small businesses owned in Philadelphia are owned by white men. So there's something wrong there, and it's not just about access to capital. Um, and these evaluations have been done over the past year and a half, two years. Um, there's, there's capital, there's absolutely capital. Um, and so who's making decisions about that capital is important, what are the rules around that capital is important, what are, how are we defining risk? Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff there to, to talk about, but there's also policy, tax code and zoning code and procurement policies and, you know, all kinds of things. And so, um, so yeah, those are the challenges that local faces, um, but, you know, why local is important, um, you know, we're looking, we're looking at some of those stats in front of us, and I think it's increasingly important around COVID recovery and relief because small businesses were so, so devastated, and because of the disproportionate impact on Black and brown-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and again, almost no data on LGBTQ businesses, which is wildly problematic, so, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that fascinating. I mean, the the capital question alone. There's arguably more capital available, kind of sloshing around uh, markets for capital than at any point in the last fifty years, maybe more, hundred years, ever. Who knows? Depending on how you count. But I mean, there's any number of bizarre kind of uh, boom bust cycles going on right now. You have to wonder why some of that capital doesn't make its way to local businesses in a more efficient, market-driven way. Perhaps um, maybe bef before uh, you get to this slide, Anna, uh, Victor asked a question that ties into local, uh, the, the why local? Um, what can local businesses do to improve environmental sustainability? That, that seems like a question Ooh. of scale, uh, maybe particularly for, you know, global environmental problems like climate change. Yeah. What, 
does local and local business have any type of advantage or unique contribution to make in that regard? That's a great question. Um, and I like to, I like to just talk about collective impact, right? So think about your own personal footprint, right? Um, and the decisions that you make every day from, you know, your energy consumption and where you're getting your energy from to your water consumption to, you know, the packaging that you buy and how you dispose of that packaging, how you travel and, you know, transport yourself around, right? All of those things are going to have an impact. Um, and so when we think about, again, the economy of scale, um, you know, a business, whether they're a sole proprietor or, you know, a hundred person or having a person business, um, you know, they, they buy things, they do things in the world. And so they're going to have, they're going to have a footprint, right? And so when you think about the fact that at least in the States, um, the small business is 99.9% .9 of all private sector employers. That is a huge, huge volume. Um, and so, yeah, adding that up to um, sort of collective impact. So, so what can a small business do? Um, same thing that we can do as individual consumers, right? They can um, make sure that their energy source is renewable and otherwise responsible, right? So cooperatively, you know, uh, I do energy co-op stuff. So um, you have renewable sources, um, you're thinking about your, your water usage. Um, and so whether that's a closed loop system or other sorts of water conservation practices, um, you're keen on your supply chain. So a local supply chain means that you are transporting things far less distance. Um, and if you have any sort of um, perishable items, it also means that you're less reliant on refrigeration. All of those things have an energy um, and emissions footprint as well. Um, and then, you know, what, what else? Like, what about your supply um, also can you consider, right? So say I'm an office supplier, um, am, I, am I sourcing materials um, or I'm an office, I'm just an office, right? Like, am I buying um, paper that has recycled content? Am I thinking about pens and pencils that, um, you know, that I don't need, you know, that aren't single use and or that have recycled content? Um, you know, am I thinking thoughtfully about my ink purchases and making sure that those are soy-based inks and minimizing the plastic cartridges? And if it is a plastic cartridge, I'm disposing of them responsibly so they can get reused and restuffed and then sell, sold back to me, right? So all of those are things that, that can be done. Um, you know, there's a lot uh, around composting and recycling, um, you know, all the perfections of uh, imperfections of Philadelphia side when it comes to, um, you know, our, our current, um, you know, current waste disposal. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, there's, there's private companies that are, that are kind of filling in the gaps right now um, for all of those things as well. So um, I think it's just, yeah, like kind of thinking about every single purchase that you make as an opportunity, right? So there's no neutral anymore. We're either contributing to the problem or we're contributing to the solution. And so think about every single dollar that you spend as a vote for what you care about. Um, and, you know, and that's, I think that's how we, um, how businesses are beginning to think about their supply chains. Um, and I think it also happens, you know, kind of in, in the products and services that they, that they're providing. So as an example, I mean, you don't have to be a solar installer, right, to, to help, um, but, um, but, you know, what's, um, what are, you know, there's a lot of, of companies in our network that are providing products and services that are helping other businesses reduce their environmental impact in some way, shape, or form. So whether that's consulting or other things, um, you know, there's, there's a whole world of options there for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh Brett Hopkins, I don't know Brett, but Brett has asked a, a very interesting two-part question that we'll leave it up to you, Anna, if you want to answer it now or towards the end of, of your talk. But two parts, uh, how can local businesses continue to have an advantage over big retailers when you have someone like Walmart trying to source local products? That seems like that would be a very mm. pressing question. And then a uh, related note is the, is the kind of magnification of the impact of a dollar spent at a local business that you mentioned this increasing the value by 300%. Does that apply when uh, a large retailer does commit to buying local, sourcing local? Do we still see that same kind of magnification effect uh, 
when you have a large retailer buying local? So mm. uh, it, those are tough questions. Uh, thank you, Brett, for those. But yeah. you know, up to you if, if, if it fits with your presentation to answer I it. I love those questions. We'll come back to it later. Welcome to my everyday work and advocacy, Brett. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, how do small businesses remain competitive? I mean, that that's a brilliant question. I think there's so many, so many things about that. Um, I think one is... I mean, policy change, absolutely, right? So I think that there's a, a need to um, reset the floor a little bit, right? Kind of like reset the floor, the minimum expectations of all businesses. And so um, we have a number of examples in our network, especially in the restaurant industry where this is surfacing. Um, they're trying to pay fair wage. They're trying to pay 15 bucks an hour, if not more, um, which means, you know, they have like restaurants already have a very, very, very slim profit margins um, and COVID devastated restaurants. And so they're trying to pay fair wage. They're trying to offer benefits. They're trying to do all of these things without gouging their customers because that's counterproductive, right? Um, and their competitors are not doing that. And so, yeah, how are they supposed to? So it's not an even playing field, right? And, you know, you could argue, well, that that's the economy. That's the marketplace. Um, and I, I don't think, I don't think anyone would agree that an uneven playing field is, is the marketplace. Um, and so, yeah, there's um, there's a need to kind of reset the floor. Um, and so that's around wages and that's around um, fair scheduling um, and other sorts of just basic practices. And if we kind of, you know, just reflect a little bit on Labor Day and we have a 40 hour work week and we have a minimum wage and we have weekends and we have an eight, you know what I mean? We have, we have all of these things. We have no child labor because we were trying to reset the floor at some point. We just haven't revisited that in quite some time. So I think it's important that we do that. Um, and I think um, the other thing, just from like an individual business perspective, is, again, at least the way that I see it and what we try to encourage our members to do is, is lean into the fact that you're local, lean into the fact that you're independent, um, you know, and market that as authentically as you can. Again, taking taking in consideration the greenwashing and everything else um, that's happening right now with big corporations, the local business I think has, has a, the ability to, to build trust um, way easier than, than a large corporation can. And so if you again, pay attention to what corporations are doing in their marketing, we're in your neighborhood, we're local, we're in your community. To me, that's them trying to um, to play into this desire that the consumer has to support a local independent business. And so for me, from a market, a market advantage, a, um, a marketing and communications advantage, I think, yeah, you can like lean into that fact. And it might not mean you're going to have, you know, um, a national audience, uh, you know, if that's not, if that's not your, your geographic scope, but you can apps like your community is your business and your business is your community and play into that for sure. So I think those are just two examples. I mean, one is one is more in the business owner's control and the other one is far less, but um, but I think it's, you know, they're both um, they're both part of part of the solution. Um, and then to the second question, I'm really grateful for this one too. I think anything that we can do to support local businesses is important, right? And I think what your question gets to is around procurement. Um, and and so, sure, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a big, a big chain. Uh, maybe I'm an anchor institution, like a, like a university or, um, or, or hospital, and I have just a bonkers amount that I buy <laughs> every, every single year. Um, and so, those organizations aren't going anywhere, right? We're not going to all of a sudden stop having those anchor institutions. And so, what can they do from a procurement standpoint to ensure that they're supporting? local independent businesses, black and brown owned businesses, women owned businesses, LGBTQ businesses in their communities. Like, and what does that mean? Is that 150 square mile radius? Is that a 20 square mile radius? What does that mean, right? And there are a lot of really great examples in Philadelphia of anchors doing exactly that. Um, so their food and, um, and their office supplies and other, all kinds of other things. Um, there's a really powerful 2014 report, um, and Jordan, if you remind me about this, I can send this forward. There's a 2014 report that Philadelphia's controller did um, that looked at the economic impact 
um, of the anchor institutions in Philadelphia and their humongous purchasing power. It's like $5 billion a year or something bonkers. And if they even um, increased the, the sort of low number they already, <laughs> they already um, source locally, if they even increase that small number by 25%, it would have a one and a half billion dollar economic impact in the city. Um, so for every dollar that's spent, it has a one and a half times return when you're kind of a, a non-local, right? Or an anchor like that purchasing from a local. So it's still a better ROI than, than not doing it. Um, and the more we can do that, the better. All right, how am I on time? You're doing great. We're, we're believe it or not, it's almost 7:30 already. But uh, you know, you have some more to tell us, and there's probably some more questions cooking. So great. Yeah. Great. So this is one of my favorite parts: is getting into a heated debate about the difference between triple bottom line and corporate social responsibility. Um, so, and we've touched on some of this in in other parts of the conversation. So you know, hopefully, it's not too much of a surprise. But um, but triple bottom line is an accounting framework, and John Elkington has you know a little bit of mea culpa over the years, and kind of maybe wishes he didn't say it quite like this. But it is what it is, um, and so it's a it's a accounting framework. It's a um, it's a way of thinking and doing that is holistic, that incorporates your social, your environmental, and your financial performance as definers of your success. So we're not just looking at your bottom line this quarter and next quarter, we're looking at other measures of success, like how well you're doing for your workers, how well you're doing in your community, how well you're doing for the planet, right? All of those things. Um, and, and in SBN's experience, those are, um, that's a competitive edge. So we have um, a number of just, I mean, all of our members are absolutely incredible. Um, really, really inspiring. One member, I love telling the story. Um, so they are a, a geospatial and software engineering firm and they only work on um, solving social and environmental problems. Um, and, uh, you know, they have, you know, 60 some folks and they've been around for, you know, going on almost 20 years now. Um, and they have, because they've built this business around um, this specialization, they have people like getting numbers, like taking numbers to do this, like, like competing for, for them to do work. Um, and uh, I think one example of how um, how successful they've been is they had a proposal. Um, can you do this project for us? Can you do this, um, this work for us? And the owner of the company, um, you know, like kind of to filter, you know, filter out like, does this, does this in line with our mission? Is this not in line with our mission? Is this something we'd be comfortable doing? Um, and kind of had a little bit of a moral compass issue, but he said, well, I mean, the project itself is 100% mission aligned, but the clients like, oh, I don't know that the client could use this in other ways, the implications of the use of this final product, I don't feel really good about. So let me bring this to my team. This is a million dollar contract, okay? Let me bring this to my team. Um, and the team said, we don't wanna touch it. We don't feel good about it. We don't wanna touch it. And this business owner turned this this, um, this contract down, this million dollar contract, right? That could not happen with a publicly traded company, absolutely not. Um, and I think that, that that really goes to show how um, not only the integrity of this, of this business owner and, and this company, but I think the, the way that this business has um, established these boundaries for what it will and won't work on, which means that folks are seeking them out because of those values, right? And there's another company that we have that has um, an engineering company that again, is only working on climate resilience issues. And they've been doing this for almost 30 years, like well before, you know, most of us were um, paying enough attention to, to climate resilience. Um, and because of that, again, they have a similar thing. They're nationally recognized um, you know, civil engineering company. They only have maybe like a dozen people on their team, but they testify you know, at, you know, in, um, in Congress and with the NRDC and they 
design manuals, um, you know, regulatory manuals and other types of things that are award-winning because they've built this portfolio with, with these values in mind. Um, and again, that's sort of become their competitive edge. So there's other things that are kind of factors in those businesses' success, obviously, but, um, but yeah, they're not just thinking about, um, they're absolutely thinking about making money. They have to be a business if they're going to be a triple bottom line business, right? You can't practice this stuff if you don't exist, but, um, but they, um, they've used, they've used their business as a force for good. Um, and they've used their values to build their business and build that competitive edge. And I think that that's the unique, that's the unique thing, right? Um, and that's the triple bottom line, um, really kind of, you know, in, in example, but this also gets to, the local brewery that is hiring folks um, with um, with experience in the criminal justice system and you know experience in in the foster system and they're paying fifteen dollars an hour and they're offering benefits and they're you know providing fair scheduling and um, and again I mean those are hard things to do when you're just starting out but you know when you when you put that out there and you say i'm charging x number of dollars for this beer because this is how i'm running my business people that care about that stuff are going to come to your business and they're going to give you money and you're going to be able to do more of that and that's really exciting um and that's very different from corporate social responsibility which is really this sort of other thing over here so it's not this integrated in everything i do it's more like this is how I run my business. And then over here, I want to compensate for that somehow, right? So I'm going to do, you know, um, this charity, or I'm going to give out this grant, or I'm going to do something um, that is, um, that's, that's mm, um, kind of like mediating the, you know, the impact, right? Um, and so that's not, I mean, that's painting with a broad brush. Trust me, it's painting with a broad brush, but um, but the vast majority of corporate social responsibility is, is other, it's siloed. It's not like incorporated into the daily -day practices of, of the business, right? So I think great examples are businesses that are paying minimum wage and, you know, overworking their workers and have a corporate social responsibility arm, like the example that was given earlier, it just doesn't square. It's not consistent. Um, and not saying the triple bottom line businesses are perfect because they're not. It's an ongoing practice. There is no arrival <laughs> for any of us. Um, we're constantly learning and growing and becoming better um, based on what we know and what we learn um, and making different decisions based on that. Um, but it, it's just kind of a, it's a philosophical difference. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I have a couple examples, um, but I think this, you know, maybe gets back to conversation we had earlier, and I'm really interested in, you know, kind of to, to poke around here a little bit on what people think about, about that distinction. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems like a major shift between, you know, giving money, uh, setting aside some small percentage of profits to give money to the local ballet, for instance, uh, versus organizing your business to be kind of committed to some of um, these principles here. Um, you know, I, I have the sense that a younger generation of, of businesses is more in line with what you're talking about and less inclined to kind of a CSR approach. Do you see that with your membership uh, or other kind of trends in, in the spaces you operate in? I do, and I see that, um, again, consumer pressure and worker pressure is also making a really big difference. And so um, I think the, um, the sort of upcoming generation, um, I don't know, maybe maybe there's a little bit of your in my generation, I'm gonna make assumptions here about, about our age, um, and then the generations both, you know, kind of like um, behind us, I think, yeah, there's a growing sense that I don't, like if I'm going to be working 40 hour plus a week, like I want to be doing that on something that, you know, that doesn't compromise my values or compromise my integrity and even better that actually does good in the world um, and whatever that means for me. Right. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think employee employers are having a really interesting time um, especially coming out of COVID, which we're still very much in, um, can't say that, very much in a global pandemic still, um, 
that employers, I think, are beginning to realize that and, and needing to position themselves, um, you know, in ways not only on, you know, kind of changing their wages and changing their benefits to be more competitive, but I think needing to prove in some ways um, to potential employees, like, you know, who are shopping around equally as much as the employer is, right? When the employer interviews, um, you know, the em potential employee is interviewing too, right? Like, do I want to work for you? Like, are you good enough for my time <laughs> and my and my talents? Um, and, and I think there's, there's an increasing trend there in addition to the, the consumer trend, um, the values-driven consumer trend. And I think that there's, um, you know, definitely some some important important work to do around affordability, right? Of some of these um, some of these products and services, um, they come at a you know slightly higher premium um, for the most part than um, than not, and I think that's because people are paying their their workers fairly and other things. Um, they're taking time to to build responsible supply chains and whatnot, and so there's a slightly you know higher overhead that they have to compensate for. Um, and ideally, you know, we kind of get to a place where that normalizes, and you know, the affordability of some of these things um, you know improves, right? Because because it can't be. And there is a perception, I think, that triple bottom line is like a nice white liberal elite thing to do. And it's not, it's a necessity. It's an absolute necessity. Um, and there are a lot, a lot of, of black and brown businesses and women owned businesses and LGBTQ businesses that are leading in this space um, that are kind of because, you know, for all, for all the reasons, right? They're leading in this space. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's kind of a, a myth to debunk here um, on who um, is practicing triple bottom line and, and who can afford triple bottom line. It's not a cost, it's an investment um, in your business's success. And, um, and you know, from a products and service standpoint, um, I think that there's an increasing, increasing trend, um, you know, in, in all communities. Um, although again, it does need to be accessible and affordable. Um, and I think we'll get there, but, um, but those are, you know, those are important considerations, I think, for, for the movement. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, I'm wondering if, if by, by way of pushing us towards a call for action for, for the rest of mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, concluding our, our thoughts for the evening here, uh, Professor Payton has asked a question here about uh, what local companies can do, you know, what exists and what could be created to support the local sustainable business ecosystem. I mean, you mentioned capital before as being something that's kind of needed, but, but are there other things that are kind of missing right now to support local businesses in pursuing a triple bottom line orientation? Uh, you know, what do they need? It, it could be one mm. of these things that everyone would want to do, but, but where do you start? What do you, you need to get there? Yeah. Um, shameless plug, support organizations like SBN who are advocating for economic ecosystem change and supporting businesses that are doing this work. I will give you our website and the link to donate. Um, and, um, and I think, um, you know, maybe more directly, although that is, I think, a pretty direct thing to do, um, although more directly, it's, it's um, just taking that extra effort. You know, if you need something from the hardware store, is there a local hardware store that you can support? If you need something from um, you know, um, like a toiletry of some kind. Is there a local? Is there a local business that you that you can go to? Um, and and again, I think that you know it takes a little bit extra work, and you might have to go a little bit more out of your way, or you know you might have to change your routine in some way because you're kind of you're you're rebuilding your own supply chain in some ways. Um, but I think that's the fun part. You're you're kind of getting to rediscover the place that you live, the community where you live, you get to rediscover, um, you know, that with, you know, with this local business community in mind. Um, and I'll say, just to underscore that, um, if you think about some of the favorite places that you've ever been, um, particularly, you know, towns and, and cities that you've been, um, you know, part of, at least for me, what's memorable 
is not the chain shopping district that everybody has. It's it's the independent business corridors. It's those it's those small businesses that make a community that give it its personality, um, and that that's really really memorable. And every single community is different, and so um, and so yeah, rediscover your communities and rebuild your own supply chains. Think about the things that you need on a regular basis. Um, are there local places you can get those? It might mean that you're exploring a different product. And that's also exciting because that product might also be more socially and environmentally responsible. Um, you know, so I'm thinking about my own co-op, <laughs> right? And, um, and all the really great things that I get there that I, that I trust because I trust their decisions in building their supply chain. Sure, sure, yeah. So, I mean, are there institutional things that, um, for instance, city of Philadelphia, state of, state of Pennsylvania, state of New Jersey, um, could offer to, to businesses in pursuing uh, these sustainability outcomes? And, and then Absolutely. we have a very meta question for you at the end uh, from yeah. Carol that we'll get to next. Yeah, that's great. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. And I guess some of the work that SDN is doing as well is to, incent is to incentivize these practices, both through carrots and sticks, right? So again, I think it's about um, changing the floor, <laughs> right? Um, and, and what that means. And so you might not be a socially or environmentally responsible business, but you're going to have minimum expectations around wage and scheduling and things of that nature that are really, really important. Um, yeah, and there's, and of course, there's other incentives, right? So Philadelphia has a pretty, pretty amazing um, tax incentive for um, for socially and environmentally responsible businesses. Um, they have a couple other tax incentives as well for businesses that hire. Um, you know, folks with experience in the justice system and other things like that. So absolutely, I think there are things that governments can do um, where there's money, there's power. And so if it's a tax incentive or a grant or something else like that, um, that's really key. And I think putting pressure on your elected officials to do that so that we're rebuilding better <laughs> from, this, from this economic crisis, because we also have an equity crisis and we also have a climate crisis. So how can you put pressure on your elected officials to connect the dots on those things um, and make sure that as we're rebuilding our economy that we're putting those pieces together. Um, and, and I would say the same thing for, you know, for the institutions that you're part of, um, whether it's, you know, this university or other institutions that you're part of, um, you know, encouraging them, asking them to, um, to think about their supply chains um, and their procurement and other things to say, you know, what are we doing in this way? And is there something that we as an institution could do better? Um, so, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. But yeah, there's, there's all kinds of things that we can do with our own personal decisions, as well as our civic engagement, um, as well as our, you know, again, donation buttons um, to, to, help, to help with the cause. I, I have to insert a question from James first. Hey, James, how you doing? Uh, but but James is asking, is there a particular area that local businesses struggle with regarding sustainability in their business practices? Is there a particular, is there one thing or is it industry specific or is it unique to each firm? Yeah, I think it varies so widely, so, so widely. And I think it depends on where everyone's starting from and yeah, the industry and the sector that they're in. Um, so, you know, an office is gonna have different challenges than a landscape contractor, you know, um, just very different challenges. And they're all gonna approach it with slightly different, slightly different ways, um, all gonna innovate in different ways to, to meet those to meet that criteria. Okay. H have you, um, in your time with SBN, noticed anything any advice you could give to someone like Gianna who's thinking about a, a, a sustainability oriented business as mm -hmm. an entrepreneur? Is there, is there some nugget of wisdom that you might offer to people that are looking to go in this direction? Mm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> stay, stay focused, stay strong, <laughs> find a peer network, absolutely find a peer network. Um, yeah, I think I think those are the ones. I think it's just trusting trusting your values, holding true to those values, and knowing that um, that you can actually build a phenomenal, beautiful business, um, you know, with with those values in mind. Um, and then finding a peer network that has experience bumping around in the beginning and experience, um, you know, um, with with the challenges and learnings that you are going to have ahead of you, um, so that you can, you know spend your time learning from them versus making those mistakes and those and those speed bumps yourself 
Um, that's a, and also the student, you know, you're just, um, it's very validating to be like, I'm not crazy. Like this is really, really hard. Yeah. Um, and that peer network is, is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah, it, it takes a village to raise a sustainable business, it sounds like. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah our, our last question, yeah, great question, Gianna. Our last question from both Carol and Joey, uh, what are SBN's plans, short-term, long-term? Is there an expansion mm. in mind? And I know this is top of mind for you uh, in particular at the moment. So any insights you can give us onto the organization itself, Anna? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so we just completed a strategic plan, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, and so looking forward, um, really the priorities are around equitable, inclusive, and climate resilient economic recovery. Um, it's been growth, and now we just have to kind of like set our step and, and talk about recovery. Um, and I think that for us, we're pretty excited um, that the current presidential administration has named economic recovery, equity, and climate action um, as priorities. And that there are pretty serious conversations, although you know, Congress aside, um, pretty serious conversations about uh, infrastructure um, and jobs and, uh, you know, again, a Green New Deal and things of that nature, which for us, we are a nonpartisan organization, but for us, those are values aligned, right? So what we want to see um, is, again, economic recovery that, that focuses on local independent businesses, specifically businesses that are owned by folks of color and other historically marginalized groups. So that is absolutely capital, absolutely capital. And that is bringing that capital down to the level um, where small businesses and historically marginalized businesses tend to be. Um, they're, not, they're not banks, they're not with big banks, they're with local CDFIs, they're with credit unions, um, right? They're with SBDCs, they're not, they're not with big banks. And so that was a big learning that the government had around the Paycheck Protection Program is they just put the money in the wrong place and the smallest of the small businesses and the most uh, marginalized businesses just couldn't get access to it. Um, so more money in the right places with specific guideposts for <laughs> business owners from historically marginalized groups, that's part one. And then part two is around industries. Um, and so SBN is really focused on um, responsible food system, recovering the food system, recovering the food economy, which pre-COVID, like in 2019, was 14% of the region's economy, employed 330,000 people, and 95% of the businesses in that economy were small businesses with fewer than 50 employees. So that, does, that economy has to really recover. And so we want to do that. And as an example, that um, industry is not known for paying fairly or other things. Um, there's a lot of issues in, in the industry. And so we want to focus on responsible um, uh, local food systems, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and nature-based stormwater management, um, and make those industries better from the inside out. Um, just thinking about infrastructure as well and learning from the New Deal and learning from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, infrastructure, yes, is consistently proven to be a tool for economic recovery. Um, and there needs to be, the money needs to be designed so that it's going to, um, so it's the capital projects are supporting equitable community development, absolutely, right? And infrastructure, you look at it, the industry tends to be predominantly white males, right? And so if we want to um, invest in infrastructure as a tool for economic recovery, one, we have to make sure that infrastructure is supporting climate action, Two, we have to make sure that, that money is supporting capital projects in historically um, disinvested and historically marginalized communities while paying attention to the risks for gentrification and preventing that so that folks can stay in their place and making sure that we're diversifying those industries by race, gender, and other identities so that people are able to contribute to and benefit from um, the investments that are being made. So that is SBN's work. Um, we're very excited about it. Uh, it's going to be local, regional, um, kind of bridging to the state. Um, and, and we've been kind of punching out of our weight class a little bit on federal advocacy the past two years. Um, and I think we're going to continue to do that until, until the federal dollars come out. And so I'm excited about that, too. Wow. So just one or two things to work on, it sounds like. <laughs> just a few, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Anna. This was really wonderful. Uh, people are clapping for you, even though you know you can't see them. I, I assure you, they are. I'm sure the start of a, a 
uh, what could be an hours long conversation on on this topic and still just scratching the surface. So um, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome back anytime, of course. Uh, and, and we really thank you for tonight. And folks uh, out there, uh, our talk will be posted to the Rowan Center for Responsible Leadership's YouTube channel. Uh, you can, you know, review something or, or share it with your friends and family. And we have a full slate of very excellent events coming up this semester. So keep an eye on your email for more info on that. But thanks again, Anna Schiff from Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia. My absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me and um, hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.